oh, okay, it's 11 a.m. AST, uh, EST, so uh, in our time zone. Hi, everyone, and welcome back. Thank you all for joining us for our first panel. Uh, because before we had the lunch and before that we had the opening um, word. So uh, the first panel to discuss innovative initiatives and field experiences in, in higher education to promote quality, equity, inclusion, and mental health in multimodal learning environments. I'm thrilled to welcome brilliant panelists who were also key co-researchers or contributors to our research project. So Jordan Schroer, Assistant Provost for Educational Resources and Innovation at the Lebanese American University. Uh, David Hornsby, Vice Provost and Associate Vice President Academic at Carleton University. Uh, Moira fisher Bachelor smith Vice Principal Learning and Teaching at University, uh, University of Glasgow. And Sarah wilson Methurst, who she is a higher education consultant and researcher. And I'm also very happy to co-moderate this panel with Alois Davidson. Uh, she's a Faculty of Arts and Science Strategic Advisor, Innovation and Director, uh, 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 Innovation and Director of the Innovation Lab at Concordia University. So uh, a kind reminder, although the chat feature is enabled, please ask your questions in the Q&A and specify the name of the panelists to whom you are addressing your questions so they can answer you. Uh, this will facilitate the whole retrieval of the questions. And I'm going to move the whole thing to Eloise. Eloise, the floor is yours. You're going to take the lead now. Thank you, Nadia. So here is the first question to our panelists. Could you, uh, could each of you share your personal perspective and involvement in fostering innovation in higher education, specifically in terms of promoting uh, quality, equity, inclusion, and mental health within a hybrid, flexible, or totally online learning environments? We would love to hear about the initiatives that you've been part of at your institutions and the impact that you've seen from these efforts and give concrete actions that help address the complexity and interconnection of these goals. So we're starting with Jordan. Excellent, there it is. A little bit uh, sticky on the unmute button. Wonderful. Thank you so much. So I, again, I'm Jordan Storm from the Lebanese American University. And in particular, what's lovely about the position that I hold there is that uh, I am responsible for our Centers for Innovative Learning. And that is the center that was, was born uh, through our Strategic Plan 3 and has is featuring prominently in our latest strategic plan that went into effect this last year, um, strategic plan four. And the beauty of that is that the center then can really has a, has a sort of established history that allows us to work across the landscape at LAU, um, in particular liaising with the Dean of Students and of course also with our faculty and, and their approach to pedagogy and in particular online uh, pedagogies. And, I think what's nice about that uh, relationship that, that we have at the center across our different units at the university is that the dean of students might not understand what faculty are doing in their classrooms, especially online classrooms. They become hidden. They become, you know, something that happens in that virtual space and nobody really knows what's going on. But through the center and by being able to bring them into some of our seminars and, and trainings, they are understanding what faculty are doing and we, faculty are understanding what talents they have for mental health referrals, for referrals to counseling, for accommodating learners with different needs, for even learning about what percentage of students in our population might have different learning needs or learning styles. So I think that's the, the beauty of uh, the job I'm in is I, I get to bring together multiple units across campus. And I think that's critical to the higher education landscape in addressing all of these big issues. Thank you. Uh, over to uh, David. Thanks. Thanks very much, Anne Louise. And uh, thanks, Nadia, for organizing this great event. I know that others have expressed their appreciation to you for convening this important work. Uh, allow me to also echo that. It has been such a privilege to be part of this project. Uh, greetings, everybody, from Smoky, Ottawa. I'm saying Smoky because we're currently inundated with uh, smoke clouds from uh, forest fires nearby. Never a fun experience, so uh, sending my thoughts out to those who are affected uh, by this. Um, you know, this is a really important question from the perspective of thinking about the notion of equity, diversity, and inclusion in our learning spaces and quality. 
you know, we can think about this at numerous different levels. And, I, and, I've, and I've sort of characterized three uh, at, in this particular moment. There's the structural level. So thinking about our policies and our systems and how do they foster uh, equity, diversity, and inclusion within our learning spaces. I've been thinking about the pedagogical, right? The how we teach question is as important in the uh, notion of extending equity, diversity, and inclusion and addressing those things. And then, of course, the content of our learning experiences. What is it that we're teaching? And, and how do we make space for a broader set of ideas and worldviews that then take into account equity, diversity, and inclusion. And here at Carleton, uh, but I know that this is sort of, these sorts of things are taking place at, at other institutions around the world, but here at Carleton, we've been thinking about equity, diversity, and inclusion in our learning environments at those three levels. You know, one of the, some of the more recent things coming out of the pandemic in particular that we've learned is that, you know, we need to integrate a more compassionate approach in our grading systems. Uh, we pretend that grading is this deeply objective experience. It isn't at all. It's highly subjective and biases and, um, you know, other sort of more nefarious uh, impacts against EDI uh, can be sort of introduced in, into those contexts. So we've set up a compassionate grading type of policy and approach that seeks to forefront equity, diversity and inclusion. Um, but, you know, we've also thought, too, at the uh, structural level, right, around how our courses are structured. Uh, we want to think very carefully around how do we transform our courses to be more uh, inclusive, not uh, just from from a from a pedagogical perspective. So the types of pedagogical strategies that we're encouraging, experiential learning, active learning, all of these types of approaches that decenter the instructor as the sort of the fount of all information and knowledge, uh, are actually about contributing to equity, diversity, and inclusion. Um, and we know it works for student learning as well. I mean, here's a double sort of uh, double win. Um, at Carleton, we've been engaging in also thinking around the notion of reconciliation in Canada, how we engage with our Indigenous communities and Indigenous knowledges has been really important. We've, we've created uh, a program called the Indigenous Learning Bundles Program, where our my colleague, who's Kahente uh, Horn Miller, who just won a 3M teaching award for this work, uh, has been leading around uh, integrating Indigenous knowledges into different disciplinary frames. And we have a whole series of Indigenous learning bundles that speak to Indigenous knowledges within biology, within uh, environmental sciences, within sociology and social work, uh, you name it, we're, we're sort of thinking about it on that score. So if we think about EDI on those different structural levels, the pedagogical, how we teach matters, and creating strategies that empower our students, when we think about the policy and system policies and systems that we have in place at the university to make space for EDI, it's important uh, there. And then the content piece, those are some, some examples of how we've approached it at Carleton. Thank you, David. Over to you, Maura. Thank you. So this is a huge question. And one of the great things about having a panel is that we each approach the question slightly differently. So I'm going to come at this from a slightly different angle, but I um, really want to build on in particular what David just said there. So um, my approach is, is to think, well, academic colleagues, uh, not just academic colleagues, but they're usually the, the, the drivers of change around their own courses, are really generally very inquisitive people who like to experiment with new things. And in terms of their own research, they're constantly looking to push boundaries and approach things with a critical mindset. And so I think there's so much innovative potential there, but often what puts them off doing the same thing with respect to their teaching is that they don't actually want to experiment on their students in case they get that wrong. And they often become frustrated if they try things and it doesn't seem to work. Um, they get negative feedback or whatever. And the other aspect is our systems and our processes can often be a bit of a barrier. And that might just be my university where we get that feedback. But from what I can tell, it's, it's not just my university. So I think part of my job is to try and align things so that we have frameworks, just as David's described, you know, make it clear. What do we mean by that compassionate assessment framework? What is assessment really for? Actually, is it how do we really engage with assessment as part of the learning process rather than just that kind of hurdle at the end? So I think there's a combination of that framework and guidance, that work to, to try and change our systems and processes to make it easier for people to innovate and, and develop their practice. But I think the other ingredient for me is working with students. So we've created a central fund that supports innovation 
And where we've worked with students to create new resources, so for, for example, EDI resources in life sciences or um, new strategies for assessment and geography that have used technology and the students have said this would work really well for us, then that's really made a big difference because the students have been massive advocates of change. It's really encouraged colleagues to try the things they were interested in. And then I think the other thing I'd say is in terms of the, the question about hybrid, flexible and online, and I think we'll come back to this later, I think we really need to think about learning hours for students. So we often think about all the content that we want to give students and the opportunities, but actually we need to think, if you have a 10 credit course for us at Glasgow, that's 100 learning hours. How much are we asking them to engage with before they even come into a class? And, and if we give them too much, it creates a barrier for students who have got lives outside of university that are also really demanding. So I think for me, it's a combination of harnessing that perspective that infrastructure and guidance that allows staff that gives them permission to experiment, but safety to do so in a way that's that's not harmful for students. And then bringing that together with our academic developers who can create those exemplars and case studies that give further confidence to embed that kind of practice. These are the things that we're trying to, to support that would really, we think, foster and embed innovation. Thank you, Maura. Over to you, Sarah. Thank you very much and thank you for inviting me and I come at this from a perspective of having been a, a head of learning teaching excellence in a UK university and also re um, recently as a consultant working in, in different environments including um, what very much widening participation context where the average age of the learner is, is 35. Um, and I'm, I'm sort of looking at this um, in emphasizing sort of mental health and well-being um, ang angle in terms of promoting that in multimodal learning environments. Um, and in doing so, I'm, I'm acknowledging um, concepts and, and, and um, uh, sorry, a little bit like uh, David, I'm looking at the sort of um, the micro, meso and, and sort of macro level in terms of what we're doing. So we're taking that kind of social analysis framework, but also looking at works, uh, the work of um, Antonovsky and uh, salutogenesis and things about stress resource coping theory. So I think we're thinking about well-being and health and ideas from um, models and population health systems as well. But also the work I've been doing with a colleague at Durham about the characteristics of expertise for online um, teaching and also work um, such as the Student Mental Health Research Network at, uh, based out of King's College and, and the work that colleagues have been doing there. So looking at the at the, at looking at the macro, starting with the macro and the institutional um, uh, a, a approach and the, and the community approach, um, the UK they've produced a university mental health um, charter, um, and that's really looking at looking within the institution actually and also extending out into the wider community in terms of thinking about creating the conditions in which health um, and well-being can flourish, and this. It, this chart try, tries to create an evidence-informed framework which universities have been using um, to, to signpost you know, the conditions under which um, students will, uh, and actually and staff, it's really important to acknowledge the uh, staff will flourish. Um, so it, it, it identifies the conditions that will create health as opposed um, will create health as opposed to um, risk factors for individuals. And it really emphasizes the curriculum as the only guaranteed port of contact for students um, and, and with academics. There will be other services, but that's the guaranteed uh, point of contact. And it's really important to, to think about that when we're thinking about designing uh, multimodal learning environments in which all um, students can flourish. And if we think about the, um, the MISO um, the level, the curriculum level, there's guidance around enhancing student mental health through curriculum and pedagogy. And one important concept there can be transition pedagogies. How do we support students, not only in terms of transitioning in, but transitioning through and out and, and perhaps in, in and out work placements and, and, and other situations. Um, and, you know, it, the, the importance there is also thinking about um, what can we do to support students and make the, the, the experience comprehensive to them, manageable and, and meaningful? And that's about participation and them as co-creators in that experience. And then finally, at the micro, micro level, examples of things like um, came, came up with the University of Derby in the UK, which is the practical recipes for student success. And there there's practical things that are, that are easy to implement. They're in the assignment brief template that I use we used at Bucks University, a fit to submit checklist. So it's really giving information to students up front, ease of access to key information that then they can use um, to 
you know, immediately to see what, what's expected of them, to move some of the hidden curriculum um, impediments to, to their progress and, and, and other things. So yeah, so th those, I think those three levels, um, but with the mental health and well-being focus is, 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 is my sort of response to that initial question. Thank you, Sarah. So the next question for our panelists is, um, building on your personal and institutional experiences, could you discuss the systemic changes you believe are necessary at the higher education level to more effectively promote quality, equity, inclusion, and mental health in a hybrid, flexible, and totally online learning environments? What major challenges, trends, and opportunities do you see at this systemic level? And we can start with Sarah. Um, yes, okay. So at, at, at the systemic um, level, I think the, um, I mean, I've talked about the mental health charter, and I think the challenges come in various ways, but they include the assumptions, beliefs and values about people hold about um, the system of education as it currently exists. Um, and those can be things around and, you know, competitive rather than collaborative, what behaviours and, and actions are rewarded. Um, and I think the trends will be an, an increase, an ongoing demand for flexibility and things that we've learned through through the pandemic. And I think the opportunity comes from recognising um, what actions um, need to be focused at the individual level. And we've heard about, you know, students need support, but also what needs to be um, directed towards the population level of, of, of students uh, and indeed staff in their development. Um, and there's models which, which if you think, of, I'm going to sort of draw a diagram in, in, in the end, if you, th if you think about um, the unit of intervention in terms of populations and individuals, and then you think of focus of interventions in terms of support and outcome improvement, obviously individual support is really, really important. And there'll be students with specific um, learning needs and preferences. And I'm thinking about things like dyslexia, dyspraxia, and other things that, that would be important to um, implement in the curriculum. I think if you're getting lots of individual requests um, for, for support and that's hitting the same kind of problem, then you need to think about integrated support models, which are going to hit specific populations of students um, and provide them with that with that support. So I'm thinking here about where and this might also include staff. So it might include staff who are new to teaching and new to online pedagogy, but it might include groups of students such as disabled, mature, commuter, uh, black, Asian, minority, ethnic and so on. I think then if you're thinking about outcome improvement, it's around um, thinking about when students come into contact with whoever they come into contact, remembering that the curriculum and staff are the guarantee point of contact for students. It's thinking about supporting staff with clear role descriptions and expectations and development uh, and providing clear kind of learning contracts between, the stu between students and staff on what the expectations are. And then finally, I think at the um, outcome level and outcome improvement level with population of students, this is where we might be using data to inform what's going on and see if there are awarding gaps with particular groups of students. So are our disabled students underperforming in an unexplained way relative to the rest of the population, are mature students underperforming and so on, and looking at those and seeing if we then need to continue to enhance um, what we're doing. Thank you, Sarah. I'll, I'll hand it over to Amora. In reverse order. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll use what Sarah just said as my, my jumping off platform there then actually, because I think the end of the last of the first question and the beginning of the second question, I think, is really set the kind of macro context really clearly. Um, and I think Sarah's points about supporting staff and thinking about curriculum is, is where I'd kind of maybe like just like to come in. Um, so I think that a lot of our universities have grown up in a way that has been about the academic structure and organization. It's been about faculties, it's been about services, and we've looked at students as fairly large groups uh, with standard services that we, we try to provide and all with, with very good intentions. But I think what we've not always managed to do is look at what we do from the perspective of the programme. And that might sound like I'm going really narrow here, but I think it's really clear that students, when they come to university, think very much about their programme and their experience on their programme and whether they feel they belong in that programme or in that school or in that academic area. And so I think that this one of the system, systemic 
considerations and there are so many I could have picked, but I think one of them is really rethinking how do we build our support and our approaches around that degree programme and that degree programme experience. And that could extend to include the learning related activities, but, but that's a unit of analysis that makes sense to a student, whereas such a lot of what we do is about how we organise our institutions and not how the student experiences the institution. So I think there's there's something around that programmatic perspective and that feeds then into how um, how we think about assessment. Just going back to that, if when we talk to students, the thing that most worries them and troubles them is assessment every time. And we could make so many changes, but actually, if we don't look at assessment from a programmatic perspective, if we don't make it you know, clear and consistent how they submit their assessments, if we don't think about sequencing of deadlines, if we don't think about our over-reliance on high stakes assessment, for example, then an awful lot of the other things we've been talking about, mental health charges and so on, actually won't make the impact that they could and should have if are not implementing changes at the level of the individual student's experience. And I think it's so important to think about that from the point of view of scaffolding so that students have that opportunity to build up experiences, recognising that they come in, some come in in later years, as um, Sarah has already said, some are mature students, they, they need a totally different type of support. But unless we think about that programme engagement and where they're coming into that and their experience through it, the rest of what we're trying to do doesn't really touch the individual student experience in the way that I think we're wanting it to have. So for me, it's that marriage between the, those broader commitments and cultural changes within the sector and how we embed that within a programme in a meaningful way that a student actually um, experiences that support the whole way through that and in practice within the context of learning and assessment that I think is absolutely fundamental. Thank you, Maura. Uh, over to David. Thanks. Thanks very much. And I, I really want to build off of uh, what uh, my colleagues have said thus far and, and really reflect on this question from two levels. One is sort of the broader higher education context globally, and then one more reflecting on the Canadian environment. And and because uh, I know it's not, I know this, it's a little different here than it is elsewhere. The, the global reflection, I think, is is thinking more precisely around how we construct our learning environments, in particular, the pathways the degree pathways and how flexible those learning experiences are. Um, you know, across the world, the degree looks very similar, right? Uh, you know, if you, you have either three or four years at the undergraduate level, uh, you're meant to sort of follow a clear pathway uh, and, and it looks ultimately the same, right? You come in and take a set of courses, sage on stage models for the most part, uh, and, and students are meant to sort of survive and come out of that after having experienced a set of exams and assessment models. I think we have to rethink the whole degree. I think we need to think about the way in which we structure it. Students now uh, are coming with, uh, you know, really legitimate uh, life issues and life experiences that uh, are not being accounted for in our degree programs. We we organize our degree programs along disciplines as if they're distinct and separate from each other. Uh, we need to think about broad problems, grand challenges, domain degrees that bring together interdisciplinary thinking, because this is the type of person that we need as a citizen, regardless of where we are, somebody who can think across disciplines and who can solve grand challenges. And, and we need to account that people have complicated lives. Uh, you know, I, I, what was it? On average at Carleton, our students work 15 hours a week on average. Uh, I know when, you know, I was based in South Africa, that was also a similar situation in the South African dynamic in the UK as well. Uh, so, uh, you know, we have to take the student context and the student experience into, into, uh, into account. We need to integrate more flexibility. Uh, doesn't mean we, we diminish quality, uh, but we need to find ways of allowing our students to access the uh, learning environments and the learning experiences in different ways. We can't just rely on the sage and stage model anymore. We can't just rely on the disciplinary degree anymore. Uh, and so that's, you know, opportunities there for synchronous and asynchronous types of experiences, recognizing outside of the classroom learning uh, opportunities, you know, work integrated learning, uh, you know, all these sorts of things which, which, which we talk about, but seem to exist at the margins of our degrees for whatever reason. And that, I think, requires, you know, from an EDI perspective, we really have to give some uh, deep consideration. Coming to the to the Canadian level, um, you know, one of the biggest challenges uh, and opportunities, I would say, for integrating EDI into our environments uh, is data, disaggregated demographic data. We are terrible at this in Canada. It is embarrassing 
actually, at how bad we are. Uh, you know, spaces like the UK, the United States, South Africa, other spaces are miles and years ahead of us in terms of understanding student experience from a disaggregated demographic perspective. Uh, for whatever reason in Canada, we like to believe that we're non-racial, that we don't, you know, multiculturalism exists and is separate from our learning spaces. We have to start getting serious at the institutional level, but more uh, at the provincial and at the national level at understanding uh, how student experiences from a disaggregated demographic context uh, factor into student success, factor into engagement, and how inclusive our universities are being as a result. And this requires having honest conversations. You know, again, we need in Canada to start having honest conversations about race and ethnicity in our in our university sector. Uh, and I think, you know, there's an openness, there's a willingness to be there. The truth and reconciliation process uh, in Canada really start opened uh, the door. The Black Lives Matter movement has really pushed that debate forward. Uh, the roads must fall, uh, you know, decolonization pushes have also forefronted these types of ideas, but we now need to take it to the next step and embed it and integrate it. So I'd say across Canada, we need to start uh, treating data more seriously and having on honest conversations around it. Thank you, David. Uh, over to Jordan. Excellent. Um, wow. So many, so many great thoughts going on here uh, with regards to, you know, so the, the, the conversation has brought me to one place and the question itself had me already over in another place. So I'm going to try to cover both and reconcile along the way. So in the question is the word systemic. And so I think to affect systemic change in the higher education landscape, the administrative buy-in is a super important element there. So if we, you know, think of the landscape as administrators, faculty, staff, and students, I think having the administration saying, yes, we value this, and now figure out how that value is going <laughs> to manifest in all the other groups. And then, you know, through their support of various policies and programs and so on, it, it can. Um, so one thing we're looking at with our students, at just getting students used to the idea of more inclusive educational spaces is opening a, a sort of specialized um, tutoring hub that's aimed at students that are differently abled. So we do have some students in wheelchairs, we have students that are visually impaired, which I realize for everybody in other places around the world is not like new and exciting, but in, in Lebanon and in our private university context, unfortunately, historically, we have not been as good at accommodating um, differences. And that's largely because they don't manifest up through the school system in Lebanon. So that's why, fortunately, now we're seeing changes in the school system, which is why we're able to see changes come about in the, the university level. And that's what's a beautiful thing is having the administrative buy-in and saying, yes, this is something we value. This is part of our mission. We're going to embrace this and we're going to do it through policies where students are engaged in this change so that it becomes normalized for them, where, you know, the staff are understanding what, how uh, their role in accommodation and so are the faculty. But now switching over to what David really brilliantly sort of touched on here is this balance between tailoring the experience and making it really, or the structure. And then of course, how do you do that when you need to scale that experience. And I love the idea of like, you know, these totally flexible programs, but also at the same for students that are maybe neurodivergent or different mental health. That's terrifying. <laughs> you know, having that many choices and thinking that you're going to like tailor your degree, that that sounds terrifying. Whereas a structure for the degree program, but a tailoring of the um, experience that goes along with it might be um, more val valuable to some of those learners. So, so getting that right is really hard. And because we haven't had a large number of, you know, students with different needs at LAU, we've been able, we, we've really given a, a very nice experience to these students because all, everything is hand tailored. Oh, you need this? Okay, just ask and we will accommodate and ask and we will accommodate. And that's great. But sadly, right, that also means that students that aren't as good at asking get left behind. So we've had this perfectly tailored system, but we need to now move to a more structured, scalable systems to ensure that everybody is included, whether they ask for it or not, they're going to benefit or know that that resource is there for them. So getting all of these balances right as you construct the policies and the procedures um, and the programs 
is I think a real trick we have to look at. And of course, that's goes back to my main point that it's all facilitated when you have the administrative buy-in so the resources can be put there. Thank you, Jordan. Um, this is all so inspiring and uh, so uh, so very full of ideas. I wish uh, I, I hope that we can uh, we can continue the conversations uh, also after. Um, I, the last question is: as we look towards the future in higher education, how can institutions best prepare for these shifts? We we wanted to move, as we said in the first session, from being reactive to being proactive. And what seems to be suggested here is that we want to move away from the petri dish to a, the university can be your friend and you can stay here uh, and it's a comfortable place to be. So, so how do we, what's the roadmap? How do we move ahead? How do we prepare for what's going on? And uh, I suppose we can start with anybody who wants to talk. Uh, we can start, maybe maybe we can start with, with David. You talked about compassionate uh, marking and some, some of the reactions were about, uh, about this. We wanna know a little bit more of what this is. I, I have a sense of what it is, but, what do you mean by it? And is everybody ready for this? Do you address the, you, do you preach to the converted? Do you address the kicking and screaming? <laughs> What's your process? <laughs> yeah, I, so, I mean, it, you, I tried to type a response to the question uh, in the in the chat. Um, you know, clearly at Carlton, we approach it from a, a policy level, right? So that, and, and we, we take, uh, we've taken sort of a page out of the book from McGill, uh, from uh, Concordia, from York, others who have very similar types of models already embedded within their, their academic regulations uh, that permit students, for example, if they've had a bad term or if they really messed up on a particular course to declare a satisfactory or unsatisfactory. So it doesn't, so the, that one course doesn't mess them up. We know from student success literatures, right, that particularly at the first year, uh, that, you know, if, if a student gets a D or an F or has to withdraw from a course, that they're much more likely to not graduate, right, or to withdraw entirely from university. So if we can, like, de-stress and take out that sort of intensity of, of having to pass everything with an A, uh, allow a student to declare a satisfactory or an unsatisfactory that doesn't necessarily mess up their, their transcript, uh, that's an important way. That's an a compassionate approach to grading, right? Um, but we know that the notion of compassionate grading is broader, right? Uh, how can we factor in unspecified or was it specified grading practices, I think is the name of the approach where, you know, you can indicate as an instructor up front, if you want to get an A, this is what you got to do. If you want to be, this is what you got to do, C, D, et cetera, and actually allow the student to choose what they, what, what sort of grade category they want to aim and pitch for. doesn't mean it's guaranteed. If they say they want an A and they're going to hand in X number of documents or X number of assignments, it doesn't mean that they're guaranteed that A, but they're pitching towards that. You understand um, how they want to approach it. And that's an empowerment to the student, right? That, and that's a compassionate type of approach. Of course, we can also think of it as the, uh, from the flexibility level, right? You know, how strict are we going to be about deadlines? Uh, you know, can we create, you know, um, opportunities for students if they've encountered a personal crisis or issue that they can find, you know, they can still complete, find find pathways to complete the course uh, in a way that they feel uh, happy with. So it's 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 a broad concept and it's defined uh, uniquely at each institution. But that's certainly, I would say, uh, a part of the future. We have elements that we do already in our institutions, but can we bring it together in a coherent package that then students understand more broadly and again, empowering them to see their future. But if I could just also reflect on this question very briefly from a maybe a bit more of a meta level, I think when we're thinking about the future and how do we address you know, our broader uh, relationship to EDI, I think we have to start coming back to, the, to a critical question and that is what are universities for? Uh, and we don't spend a lot of time talking about the social compact anymore. We just think that what we do is intrinsic and that people value us intrinsically. I don't think that is the case. Uh, certainly, at least in Canada, there's significant pressures. I know in the UK, there's significant pressures through the research assessment exercise, the knowledge, the teaching excellence uh, framework, et cetera, et cetera, that really challenge this notion of the, of the intrinsic value. Uh, so I think we have to start getting explicit again about answering the question, what are universities for? 
uh, and what we contribute to social transformation in society. And that's an important way of coming at and making sure the relevance of EDI and universities is, is made explicit. Thank you, David. Does anybody else want to interject? Uh, yeah, maybe, could I maybe pick up? I, I missed a little bit of what David said at the start because I was trying to answer a question and I'm not very good at typing an answer to one question and picking it. But but the point where you you were you were finishing, David, I absolutely agree with you. And one of the things I think that universities need to, and it's not easy, but need to do is a lot of awareness raising. There's a framework that says if we want to make change, there needs to be awareness, commitment, and competence. And I can't remember the author, so I'm very sorry for not citing that properly, but I find it really helpful. You know, we might be really committed to making changes. We might also be quite competent, but actually if our colleagues don't have that awareness, it's very difficult. But I don't think it's just our colleagues. I think at a sector level, it's very difficult to get universities to speak with one voice to governments, for example. But all of what we're discussing is, is kind of only really a pipe dream if there isn't clarity about funding for education. Because, you know, we have, we know what funding we have, and we know what the pressures are, and we know what we can deliver within that financial envelope. All the other things, whether that's kind of, um, you know, shorter courses or upskilling or all of these other things, we need continuity of funding and long-term policy commitments to these things if universities are then going to be able to turn these large organisations and shift our prioritisation, our funding allocations, and all of the other things that follow Otherwise, all we do is we put more and more pressure on our colleagues to make what looks like incremental adaptations to new streams of funding when actually they're not incremental, they're sizable changes in people's workload and in their time and actually potentially also in their learners. So I think there's something about being realistic about the funding environments that we work in, the aspirations of our governments and, the, and policymakers, and actually the fact that they are certainly in the UK they're, they're not sitting with the luxurious position of being able to allocate additional funding to all of the different parts of the economy that need it. There's a, a rationalisation process going on there. And it follows through from school. You know, we can't just make changes in universities. It's got to come through schools, universities and, and, and their own. And I think there are quite a lot of, and I'm, I'm not saying this to be negative at all. I'm just saying this to kind of help us think about what are the, the different lines of communication that we need to have. But there are many compelling reasons to not change what we do. You know, if we think about accrediting bodies, they often like to see us do things that are familiar to them and become a little bit nervous about change. Interdisciplinary degrees, are they doing enough about the core discipline? You know, there's lots of things like that. Parents, I don't know about you, but during the pandemic, there were lots of parents saying, what's all this online learning? That's not high quality. You know, so there's so many stakeholders that we actually need to work with. Um, quality bodies and others to shift that perception of what is good quality learning experience. Someone made the point flexibility doesn't mean weaker quality, but flexibility offering that institutionally is a massive investment. It's a huge, huge investment. So I think that these are the kinds of conversations we need to have in our universities. And there's another thing, which is that for our colleagues to change They've got to feel that there's, I don't like the expression burning platform because it's, but it, but you know what I mean? There's got to be an imperative for them to do that. They're busy, they're, they're, they've are they're got their students, they've got their practice. There's not always a lot of capacity to change. So I think we've got to really be confident that there's that right institutional framework before we ask of our colleagues more change or more adaptation without that certainty that we can actually support that and resource that in the longer term. And that really is a, a sector level dialogue in, in my opinion that will differ depending on where we're situated and has to be understood in the context as David says of the other instruments that are operating within our our sectors but I think these are really fundamental all it takes is a shift in government to say we're funding this activity and not this activity and we turn but 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 we also can't do that on an annual basis so I think that the quality of that dialogue is absolutely imperative for absolutely everything else that we've been discussing today. Can I follow? Can I follow on from that? Because there were some great points there. Um, the, the original question was about best preparing, and I think just just to picking up the point about data, I think we need to use data well. We need to be evidence informed. We need to be aware of how different student groups are progressing and and and, and how well they're progressing, and any unexplained um, awarding gaps. I think so. That's really important, and 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 and, and again, you know, in a compassionate way, and I think. You all talked about the best prepare for these shifts, these trends. I think the demand for, for flexibility, demand for multimodal, um, different 
pathways and formats will 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 continue and i think the debate about um quality is really really important a really important point there mora and i think there has been a, a, a um, there has been some in some quarters i think there's been a conflation of um online with covid and, and and so people think that online is bad because it's taken me back to an experience i really didn't enjoy and some of those experiences we did our best didn't we but they weren't designed you know they weren't designed as on, online experiences they were in-person teaching shifted online and i think that the in terms of preparation i think the focus because of this the, the centrality of, you know the student experiences with the curriculum and with staff i think it including it, really that preparation needs to include supporting staff and new forms of staff development that that um, look at the the, the challenges um, that staff face when when understanding online pedagogy, and the pros and cons of in person and online, and what each are good for, and each you know each have their strengths and their weaknesses, and not saying one is better than or the other, but each has their place um, in, in in a well designed curriculum. And um, some of my own sort of research is indicating that there is some strong antipathy to online teaching and a strong preference for in-person and there is a little bit vice versa but mainly um, favouring in, um, in person because of mental models and assumptions beliefs that underpin you know what people think about um, what teaching look, looks like and their own kind of preferences and we know from this there's fairly good evidence in the literature that in-person teaching does favour white male and neurotypical learners it favors it doesn't you know and there are instances where other learners will really benefit from those imperfect um in in person um experiences no pun intended by imperfect um but you know what, what we're arguing is teachers can't be inclusive and effective for their supportable students if they're just privileging one kind of learning experience over another and that we need to use both well um in the future and but we also then need to support staff um in in their you know unpacking some of their assumptions and beliefs and um, in, in a supportive, compassionate way, and then thinking about, you know, what would work best for, for particular learners in particular circumstances. So I think taking that learning, so that I think is part of the preparation that we need to do is working, is working with staff in that compassionate way um, and in that developmental way and, and acknowledging obviously that, that, that they are um, experts in their field. And, and, that's, and, and that's something that, you know, is, is, is so important. And this is what students are coming to, to learn about. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, Jordan, did you have anything to Excellent. add? Excellent. I have lots, <laughs> lots to add because it's been such a nice, rich conversation. Thank you, everybody. Um, in particular, I liked uh, Moira what you were saying. You know, we are we we're stuck with government, right? Our governments make rules. In Lebanon, for example, our government does not recognize online degrees, so we've had to make all kinds of impressive um, maneuvers in order to offer our online programs. Um, so government has a large influence on, on what the universities are doing, and, and it does feel very much it's the government telling the university rather than the university telling the government um, in many cases. So that idea of sort of a, forming a, a unified voice across universities is just lovely. Also accreditation, right? The accreditation process, it has another sort of dictatorial effect on what, not necessarily what we teach, but how we teach, how we structure our educational environments and um yeah, yeah it's sort of a symbiotic evolution so we're never sure it's accrediting accreditation leading um education or education leading accreditation but it's sort of the symbol symbiotic um evolution which is not necessarily actually explicitly thought of uh thought about um or advocated for the way david was uh, proposing and then of course we can't leave out of the discussion ranking right we all go around chasing rankings and that has um, also, or at least we do, especially in this part of the world, chasing rankings and that how and how we do it and, and maybe why we do it. Um, so there are those uh, sort of things to think about. And I like the idea very much of universities um, and the cross university dialogue. So rather than how are we going to run our own university, but how can we as universities come back to that fundamental question of what is it we do why and um you know how do we want to do it um going forward so lots of, of elements there and i think my connection is a little choppy so i'm really sorry for that 
No, no need to be sorry. We understand the context and we understand the, that there is, this is beyond your control. So thank you for participating and uh, for your for your contribution here. Um, we are approaching the end and I don't want to neglect the fact that there are some interesting questions emerging from uh, our participants. Uh, Mathieu Plourde talked about uh, students play the game of grades in part because universities play the game of rankings. And uh, that's a comment that I think is important that we remember is like, what now, what do we do with these rankings and the whole idea of you know ranking and marks and you know my first of my class or my last of my class is my university the best and what do I do with my education is really key. Um, there was a question for uh, Mora and uh, somebody was uh, Selma was asking a hard point to take into account uh, all the personal life work students may have outside their studies and this is a growing issue. Uh, David mentioned uh, the amount of hours students work at Carleton on average 15 hours is huge. Uh, given that some people don't work. So that means that some people work full time. Uh, so how do you ask them for the right amount of homework versus trying to make more work during the same time of the course? And I guess this calls back to, you know, a step back and maybe we can hear some panelists talk about like, what is our social contract here? Like what, what exactly do we need to do as a university when the life and the schedule of students have shifted. We no longer have the liberty to have students who have a lot of time to think and tinker and stay on campus and spend endless amounts of hours doing homework because of their busy schedule. So what do we, like, how do we put in that, that judgment call? You want me to start with what I tried to respond in the question, <laughs> but my multitasking is poor, so I'll give it a second go. Um, I mean, my, my starting point would have to be our quality framework. So there are certain thresholds and expectations set out in our national quality framework that would say something about the, the total hours that students would do for the number of credits they're being assessed for. So that's helpful because that gives us a, a benchmark. But I, I think it's easy to forget, you know, because we know our subjects and we've been in, in academia for a long time, how long it takes a student to write an essay, how long it takes a student to read a paper. And if our reading list includes, you know, three monographs, six, you know, 16 papers, and they're expected to read them all, that's probably going to take them some way beyond the expected hours for the course. So I think some of it is just about going back to, to, to first principles and saying, you know, how many hours is a student expected to study? And then where can we build in flexibility? So, you know, usually the contact time that they have with us, for example, will be a fixed number of hours during their, their lectures, seminars, tutorials or labs or whatever. And the rest is private study. So within that, I think there is flexibility. But I would say the other thing is really, really listening to our student representatives. So we have you will all be the same. We have around 2,000 students who are par parents. Uh, we have others who are carers. So they're understanding, you know, sometimes leaving the assignment um, submission timeline open for 24 hours is better because they can start and finish it. You know, they can submit at different times of the day. Our exams, we can move when we move them online. Let's have a window open so that they can take those caring responsibilities on whilst completing their work. So things like that, it's the students who are, absolutely influencing how we think about things because their world is so different certainly to the experience I had um so for me it's that conversation and that conversation in the context of our quality frameworks thank you Maura David had a an intervention yeah I want to I really want to build off of, of Moyer's point and and sort of come back to thinking you know more broadly yeah we have to reinforce what our degrees and our courses are for uh, and 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 say you know make it really explicit to our students that when we ask them to do something for an assessment that there is a purpose to it and that purpose is of relevance to their lives and and you know I was really struck just in my own reflections about when I was teaching in South Africa I was teaching a class uh, introductory to international relations 500 students first term first semester right so this is like I'm getting them fresh uh, they were wanting to come in and try and understand the international system. Uh, my first year teaching it, I completely bombed out. I completely bombed out because I thought, you know, I needed to be a sage on stage, that they needed to write perfect essays, uh, and that, you know, they, they, they should understand intrinsically the importance of what they were there for. Um, you know, the, the feedback I got was, no, like, we need to understand what this is about. Uh, why do why should we care about international relations? Because we're going to dedicate time to it. And if we, it isn't clear why we 
why we should care, we're not going to get it, dedicate time to it. And I think that's something that sort of moves across context. So thinking and being really explicit about why it is we're asking students to do particular assignments and assessments and being really, you know, trying to tie it into the broader picture of relevance uh, to, to either so, so societal problems, to understanding, you know, positions and, and processes, to everything from, you know, chemical reactions and why we should care that chemical reactions matter because, well, I'm looking outside and there's a pretty big chemical reaction happening in terms of the smog hanging over, uh, hanging over Ottawa and, and why it's important that, that we understand that. So I, I, it comes back to, I think, being really clear uh, about what it is that we're asking our students to do and why it's of relevance to them. Thank you, David. Um, we have reached 1150. Um, I think that this was all the time we had. Nadia, are, are we uh, are we very tight for, for lunch or can yeah. we allow hey, one more intervention? Let's, let's do very quickly Jordan and Sarah and then I will finish with my thank you. Go ahead, Jordan. Amazing, thank you. So this is um, sort of tangentially related, but it, it was a nice trick that we discovered by, by accident um, with my students and it ties into the, the time management, working students and um, uh, virtual learning. Um, so I partnered my class uh, in, in Beirut, Lebanon with students in Boise, Idaho. That's a 10 hour time difference. And one of the comments we um, got back or actually from several student groups we got back were, this was amazing. My group in Lebanon could be working while I was uh, sleeping and my group in Idaho could be working while I was sleeping and we could finish the project without ever having to pull an all-nighter or work too hard. So sometimes, you know, you can exploit virtual exchange and time differences to make everything work out great. Thank you, Jordan. Sarah? Yeah, just a quick final point, just um, picking up um, something that, that David said, I think activity-led and um, and activity-based um, learning can, can address some of the challenges, you know, the why, you know, why we're doing this presenting, um, you know, meaningful um, learning experiences. But I think in, in doing that, we also need to make sure that we are sensitive to students with different demands on their time. And, and I think some of the things that Jordan mentioned there, you know, being able to engage in different elements asynchronously and, and having that kind of structure and framework can be really valuable. But yeah, it's just endorsing those points and activity-led approaches can work really well. Thank you so much. So a big, huge thank you to our panelists for your, your everything that you've shared. It's so uh, valuable. Um, thank you, Louise, for facilitating this discussion. So now we're taking a, a bit a longer break and we're coming back at 1 p.m. to continue the discussion with another also uh, brilliant panelist, but this the 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 coming panel will be totally in French. So have a great lunch, everyone. And thank you again for the panelists. Thank you, Anne-Louise. And um, see you at 1 p.m.